We'll just wait till uh, people, I can see people starting to join. Mm -hmm. Kia ora to everyone who's uh, slowly joining the, the webinar. We'll just wait a few minutes uh, as people join and then we will get going. As people are joining, um, we are going to. We've got a few polls that we're going to run uh, for people's interest. Um, are you good, Miles? Okay, we've got some polls. Um, we're just going to start that. So as people are, are joining, you'll see uh, on your screen uh, some polls, and we're going to have the first one open now. So feel free to go in and give your rating to the to that first question there. And you can, um, people who are just joining, uh, you can do that poll. It'll stay open for a little while, and we'll we'll uh, do uh, the second polls as we as we progress through through the session. So we might give it one more minute, and then Miles, I might hand over. Are you in a position? Are you microphones working? All good? You can hear us? Can you can we just check your mic? It is working. How's that? That's beautiful. Welcome. Too much technology for me. <laughs> okay, we're good. Uh, so, look, we might start. Um, and Miles, I'll hand over to you to do the intros. Cool. Kira, thanks, James. Um, hi, my name's Miles Lind. I'm the president of IPWEA New Zealand. And uh, it's very exciting to have you all here today uh, for this our second webinar. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes and just acknowledge our NAMS partners um, for their support of IPWEA. So we've got Just Add Lime, GHD, WSP, SPM Assets, Morrison Lowe, War Consultants, and PDP. I also encourage you to check out our calendar. You'll see in November coming up is our um, NAMS forum, our Advanced Asset Management Forum. This only comes around every two years, um, so have a look at that on our website. We've also got our digital badges uh, and we're looking at future generations of those. Um, if you're looking for readily consumable um, testing and uh, qualifications around asset management, uh, I can't recommend these enough and our international partners are starting to pick these up as well, which is very exciting. Um, another new product that we've launched this year is NAMS Plus, that's plus with a symbol. Um, if you're tired of writing asset management plans, it's, if it's too much money going into those, this is a, a, a system that's been developed in Australia and it's widely used now throughout municipalities in Canada to streamline asset management development. Um, I want to thank Tonkin and Taylor and the staff at IPWA for setting up this webinar today. Um, I really appreciate the efforts and I apologise for my <laughs> technical incompetence. Um, you'll notice most people will be on mute, uh, that's for sound, and if you've got any questions, we've got uh, the flash system on the side with regards to polls and asking questions. Sustainable public infrastructure is essential for the well-being of our communities, and it's a key foundation of resilience of our economy. Today's webinar is going to focus on how councils can look at how they approach climate change, and in particular resilience as they start looking into their long-term plans into 2021 and, of course, well beyond that. Um, we've brought together a number of industry experts um, from around the country to help us with our conversation today. Um, we've got Tonkin and Taylor, the Kapiti Coast and the Office of the Auditor General. The way we're going to do today is a little bit of a tag team, uh, so you won't get too much more from me, but I'll just take a moment and introduce our speakers today. Um, so we're going to have James and uh, Glenn from Tonkin and Taylor speaking on climate change and the considerations of what that means in your infrastructure planning, both in terms of climate change and risk adaptation. Um, they're also going to explore some of the ideas around how to factor climate change into your long-term strategies. 
James has got a career spanning 20 years in infrastructure and environmental, um, including working in infrastructure planning, natural hazards and climate change. I've had the pleasure of working with James uh, with the local government risk agency business case back in the day. Uh, we didn't get that one over the line, but that was a lot of good fun. Um, and I've also worked with James down in Queenstown in a past life. Uh, James is the head of Tonkin and Tay's Tonkin and Taylor's Climate Change and Resilience Practice. Uh, he's joined by Glenn, who specialises in local government uh, asset management and resilience. Like James, he's got over 20 years experience across the four waters, including a decade uh, of experience as a, as a council uh, service provider and asset owner. Um, we're also joined by um, Kristen Atkin from the Office of the Auditor General. Kristen's going to talk about um, the OAG's interest in climate change and resilience and talk about some of their observations on what they saw in the 2018 long-term plans. Uh, she's also going to provide us some insight as to what the role of the auditor is, uh, which can give us some pretty powerful insights as we look at our 2021 uh, long-term plans. She's also going to share with us, uh, just at a high level, um, the work plan of the OAG over the next few years as well. So uh, watch out for that bit. Kristen is responsible for the officer's uh, relationship with councils uh, in the Bay of Plenty, Waikato and Gisborne. Um, she has a principal experience in natural resources uh, management policy and implementing uh, with the time, um, the Ministry for the Environment working on the cl climate change adaptation. Before joining the office, she was a principal advisor in Wellington Water, where she focused on the RMA, asset management and long-term planning. We're also joined by Dr. Brandy Griffin from the Kapiti uh, Coast District Council. Kapiti will share with us, uh, sorry, Brandy will share with us Kapiti Coast's experience in attempting to implement climate change into their long-term plans. And this is actually a really nice uh, piece of work. I, I got to see a little bit of this earlier. Um, um, there's some real challenges, I guess, in a lot of coastal New Zealand and how it responds to climate change. And um, we really appreciate Brandy joining us today. Brandy's got experience as a policy advisor, specialist in strategic planning and evidence-based policy management. Uh, she's working, uh, as we all are, to try to embed a uh, great word, climate change considerations throughout our planning documents and uh, ultimately our asset management practices. Uh, without further ado, I will hand over to James. Thanks, Miles. Uh, kia ora, everyone. I'm going to crack straight into this. Um, and our first session is going to provide some context. And I think it's important just to sort of uh, ground some of the knowledge around climate emissions, climate risk, and so the rest of the discussion flows, flows well. Um, so just an agenda for this first session is I'd like to talk a bit about the context and climate risk, drill into uh, climate risk and resilience, and finish up with some brief thoughts on the role of long-term planning. So it is urgent, and I'd like to start with this slide. Some of you may have seen it before. This is from the Rodney and Otamatea Times in 1912, and it reads, the furnaces of the world are now burning about 2 billion tonnes of coal a year. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it adds about 7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly. This tends to make the earth, the air, a more effective blanket for the earth, and to raise its temperature, the effect may be considerable in a few centuries. So this, uh, over 100 years ago, from just north of Auckland and Rodney. So quite a, a prescient piece back then. Some of you will have seen the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. This is driving a lot of the decision making uh, in governments and also the, the focus on 1.5 as opposed to two degrees. And if you look at some of the differences that uh, the science is predicting between a 1.5 degree and a two degree world, it is stark. And just if you look at say the extreme weather there, this is at uh, the end of century. So at the end of century in a two degree world, we might have 170% increase in flood risk, but in a 1.5 degree world, it's a 100% increase in flood risk. So there's almost a doubling there of difference in that relatively small difference in our target for that uh, level of warming between 1.5 and 2. So this is driving that focus on 1.5 degrees. 
You will have also seen the various RCP scenarios that are useful in thinking about the future. Uh, we're currently on the RCP 8.5 scenario. So that is this red line uh, heading skywards. And there are the other scenarios that you might have heard of are the RCP 6, RCP 4.5, and the, the target, which is the blue line RCP 2.6. So this is where we need to be heading in terms of reducing emissions, this blue line. However, when we're thinking about risk and, and scenarios and what might happen, we need to think about the full range, particularly our current trajectory, which is RCP 8.5. And bear in mind, these are medium scenarios and there are thousands of model runs that sit behind those. And that sort of is the blurry lines in the background. So the science, the science is constantly developing and constantly changing. The other piece of information which is useful uh, that is, I guess, entering our language around climate change is the concept of a carbon budget. And that basically says that we have a fixed amount of carbon that we can emit into the atmosphere before we hit that 1.5 degree target. And the current estimate, if you read this text in the bottom right, for a 66% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees, we have a budget of around 420 gigatons of CO2. If we retain and maintain our current emissions rates, that 420 gigatons is used up in around eight and a half years. So we need to act now and the urgency is real. And this idea of a cliff is rapidly approaching. The longer we leave it, the steeper the reductions that are going to be required. So that's a bit of background on, on the 1.5 degrees and the urgency. When we think about climate risks, as most of you are aware, there are a range of climate hazards and climate projections for New Zealand in terms of the east becoming drier, the west becoming wetter, um, and changes in extreme events and sea level rise, etc. And then uh, you would have seen the National Climate Risk Assessment released yesterday, which goes into a, a lot of this. At a global level, this is an interesting slide. It if you the, the vertical axis is highest impact and the horizontal axis is highest likelihood. So that top right hand box are the worst risks um, that the World Economic Forum sees and they include failure of climate change adaptation and mitigation, natural disasters and biodiversity loss in there. Similarly the insurance industry is seeing an increase in uh, both insured losses and overall losses. And there are a number of factors that drive this, including um, people migrating to cities, increasing value of assets, but a, a factor in this increasing loss is climate change and increased um, instances of extreme events. And bringing us back to the infrastructure conversation is important. And we see these extreme events, but I'll, if you read this, it's, it points out that Katrina killed more than a thousand people due to infrastructure failures and mismanagement of emergency resources, not because of where it's set on the record charts. So an important thing to remember that yes, we're dealing with increasing extreme events, but we also need to really focus on how we manage our infrastructure networks and the way we respond to extreme events. And we shouldn't forget that our infrastructure is there to provide benefit and services to our communities. And this kind of drills that home in Houston having three 500 year events in three years. And the prices of some of those essential services went through the roof. So the normal price of petrol in Houston was around $2 a gallon. And here it's at about $9 and prices of water at about $42 a pack and they're normally about five bucks. So we get these, you know, societal um, outcomes that we mightn't expect and, and they're actually, I presented this um, last year at a, at a conference and some people in the audience commented that some similar behaviours had been observed in New Zealand after the Kaikoura earthquake. So it's, um, we're not immune to this. Insurance losses in New Zealand are increasing with about $150 million of mean annual losses from extreme events. And that's only the insured losses, there are uninsured losses as well. And when we look briefly at what is happening in the, in the kind of policy and legislative environment, there is a lot going on. 
Um, I draw, I'll draw your attention to the right hand slide here, which is the National Climate Risk Assessment that came out today has a, a strong focus on the on five domains, including the built environment. So of, of really high relevance to this conversation today. Um, LGNZ in the middle there, their, their sea level rise survey looking at council owned infrastructure exposed to sea level rise. And the one on the left is a pending uh, proposed um, change by the government to make the disclosure of climate related risks mandatory for certain businesses and activities. Um, and that uh, also correlates to the Zero Carbon Act, which has a reporting power. Um, the Office of the Auditor General, which Kristen's going to speak to in their increased focus on climate and resilience, as well as discussions that are happening within the Climate Commission and the Infrastructure Commission about this. So there's a lot going on, um, but it's all pointing by and large in the same direction. And I'll just finish up now. Um, I know I've raced through this, but I'm keen to hand over to, to Kristen. Is that some thinking about what types of principles are important when we're thinking about long term planning? And when we and we'll come back to this later in, in the session, but we need to be thinking about both risk and adaptation. So that's the orange on the right. So how we deal with the extreme events, but also how we mitigate our our climate change and carbon emissions. So the mitigation is around reducing emissions. The adaptation is around responding to those risks and vulnerabilities. And here is here's a set of principles, and I won't sort of talk to them in detail, but I'll go through them quickly. So number one is factoring climate risk into all our decisions, using approaches and definitions that are simple and that people can buy into. And there is a lot of language and confusion that uh, changes between different practice areas, particularly within asset management, moving into the climate change world. So it's important to, I guess, Get our heads around that if you're a practitioner and use language that people uh, are familiar with and is simple and people can buy into. Second one is basing decisions on evidence and current national guidance and having that supported by sound data and knowledge at your local level. Three is cooperation and collaboration at both nationally, regionally and locally but also making sure that roles and responsibilities are clear. And this is really interesting when we enter into the roles and I guess spheres of influence that asset managers and councils have in terms of say reducing emissions and whose role and responsibility that is. So that's that's a, a live discussion um, uh, that's, that's ongoing. Number four is stewardship and kaitiakitanga and showing that sense of precaution in, in our decision making. Five is around prioritizing vulnerable communities. Something that uh, is again uh, emerging, I guess, in terms of how we consider vulnerability within communities, but is central to our, our management and response to climate change risks. Six is long term adaptive thinking, and seven is considering actions which may have multiple co benefits or have low regrets. So, they're decisions we can take with some degree of certainty that they're not going to have, uh, be, uh, have perverse outcomes or be a, a poor spend of money. So I'm going to pause there and I'm going to hand over to Kristen uh, to take on the, the next section. Thanks, Kristen. Well, thanks, James. Um, and yeah, as, um, as Miles mentioned, I'm a essentially a relationship manager in the local government team here at the Office of the Auditor General. Um, but do have a background in RMA planning and natural resource management, um, most recently at Wellington Water. So I've been here about four years. Um, so I guess a forewarning that if anyone has any tricky um, audit or finance related questions, then I'm probably not the best person to answer them. I am going to be covering um, the the elements of, of what we expect to see in the 2021 LTPs um, in, a, in a more sort of strategic general sense. So I'm going to be covering the role of the auditor, um, what, um, what their role is in auditing your long term council long term plans and their consultation documents. Um, what we saw in the audit of the 2018 LTPs and associated infrastructure strategies. And then I guess what you'll mainly be interested in is getting ready for your 2021 LTPs. Um, what do we think um, needs to, to happen to really lift the game 
um, and get greater, greater transparency of what councils are already doing and planning to do in the climate change and resilience space and um, and what we've indicated to auditors that they should expect to see in this 2021 round. And then I'm going to wrap up just by um, highlighting what we've indicated in our annual plan that we put out a couple of months ago um, over the next three years, looking at climate change and resilience and also some work that we're doing uh, just about to kick off looking at local government risk management. So um, I thought I'd just kick off first though by just a little bit of a um, Auditor General 101. Um, not everyone in the audience will necessarily be aware of, of um, the role of the Auditor General and, and why we would even have an interest in climate change and resilience matters. So um, the Auditor General is an ind independent officer of Parliament. Um, they're appointed for seven years. Our current Auditor General, John Ryan, has been in the role for two years. The other two independent officers are the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment and the Ombudsman. So our work is primarily, about 90% of it is um, doing your, your standard financial um, audit work and also looking at um, other non-financial um, performance management aspects. So things like um, your financial statements and audit of your annual reports. And of course, um, for councils, we also do your LTPs, etc. We do also have, um, that leaves us with about 10% um, discretionary work. So we do also carry out performance audits and inquiry work. And um, just recently we finished two years worth of work looking at aspects of water management. So we do have quite a, I guess, a, a, broad, um, a broad remit, a broad area of interest. Basically, um, any aspects of um, public, public management um, and accountability. So um, the, the way we express um, the ultimate outcome that we're seeking as an organisation is that Parliament and New Zealanders can have trust and confidence in the public sector. And for this to happen, um, the, the public sector needs to be performing well and provide reliable, meaningful and timely information so that they can be held accountable. And for councils, um, accountability um, rests with the community. So we're interested in climate change and resilience from a governance, transparency and accountability perspective. Um, and the reasons for that being that, you know, climate change, it's really almost stating the obvious, climate change is being felt now. Um, it's posing already significant risks to people, to property and the environment. These risks need to be managed well and they need to be managed over the long term and in a financially prudent manner. Um, that, that we need to take a financially sustainable long-term perspective of climate change. And um, forecasting what expenditure is likely to be needed um, equally requires a good understanding of risk. Communities, of course, are demanding more from councils and central government. Um, they're demanding action now, responding to climate change effects now, and significant public money is spent on managing risks associated with climate change and in enhancing New Zealand's resilience. So I was going to touch on the climate change risk assessment that was released yesterday, maybe just to highlight um, when I was having a quick flick through um, and linking back to our interest from a governance perspective, they, they note under the domain of governance that one of the two key risks is that risk of maladaptation across all domains due to practices, processes and tools that do not account for uncertainty and change over long timeframes. Um, I just thought I'd quickly highlight too, I note that the government yesterday announced new funding of 100 million for infrastructure projects designed to protect New Zealand against the impact of climate change. So I guess, as James said, we're really seeing a, a lot of activity in this space. So the, the role of the auditor, um, the role of the auditor is that they're, they're essentially required to an express an opinion about, about whether each council's long-term plan is fit for purpose. And by fit for purpose, we mean that it meets the purpose of the Local Government Act, 
um, i.e. it enables democratic local decision making and action by and on behalf of communities and that the LTP promotes the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of communities in the present and for the future. And the other limb to the audit opinion is that the auditor needs to be able to gain assurance around the quality of the underlying information. Things like your asset management plans. Can that underlying information be rela relied upon? Are the assumptions that the council is making reasonable? And what we mean by reasonable is, is the council using the best information available and that that information is based on a credible source? Um, and so, for instance, that would be the Ministry for the Environment um, latest climate change scenarios, or if your council has prepared its own climate change scenarios, um, engage NIWA, for instance, then that would be seen as a credible source. And the information and assumptions need to be reliable, relevant, and presented in a way that your community can actually understand so that they can engage in the long-term planning process, that they understand what your current understanding of climate change risk is, where the gaps are, um, what you're proposing to do to address those gaps, um, what future big decisions are on the horizon, um, so that they can then um, participate in, in long-term long planning decision-making. So even before the, the auditor starts actually doing the audit, um, they get a good understanding of each council's business. Um, so they gather a whole raft of information more broadly around what are the major environmental issues that that region, district or city are facing, um, whether the council's recently experienced natural hazard disasters. Um, and they also look at things like, what are the strategic priorities of the council? Does the council have a climate strategy um, and other, other um, strategies like your urban growth strategy? And how do, they, um, how do they set the strategic direction of the council? So I'll just quickly touch on what we found from um, our 2018 audits. Um, so we produced two reports that are available on our website. One that reports on what we found from the audits of the consultation documents and the, uh, the main one um, looking at the 2018 LTPs. So we were interested in looking at how councils had responded to the 2014 changes to the Local Government Act um, that require, count, required councils to prepare their 30 year infrastructure strategies and um, how, and, and within those, um, how they intend to manage their infrastructure assets, taking into account the need to provide for the, infrastructure, for the resilience of infrastructure assets what risks their infrastructure faces from natural hazards, how they intend to manage these risks and how they've made appropriate financial provision for those. So we looked at two key um, aspects of the, the infrastructure strategies in particular, um, how councils have described the risk to their assets from natural hazards and what approaches councils identified to provide for that resilience. And I guess in a, in a very high level um, sense, what we saw was that councils don't actually know the extent of the challenges they're facing in responding to climate change. And that there's a risk that they're forecasting expenditure without a good understanding of risk. We also highlight in the report, just a bit of a, a, a backdrop to that, um, that compared to the 2015 LTPs, the 2018 LTPs forecasted um, a more than 30% increase in capital expenditure when compared to the 2015 LTPs, with a number of councils coming close to their debt limits. And of course, um, currently with, um, with COVID, um, we're seeing even more pressure on growth councils in particular as they come close to those debt limits. Um, so that really the, the message from that is that when um, councils are running close to their debt limits, they're forecasting significant growth 
programs of work, that it can make them very vulnerable to um, and, and limit their ability to respond effectively to climate change impacts, to really, you know, plan for, um, well, not plan for, but to and to be to be prepared for um, events that are really difficult to predict when, um, when, where, and, and what. So just turning to um, what we what we saw in terms of councils, how councils have described the risk to their assets from natural hazards. Um, we, we noted that many councils have a limited understanding of the risks, natural hazards and climate change posed to their infrastructure assets. And um, in our view, um, councils generally have a limited understanding of the condition and performance of these assets, particularly the three waters. Councils know, in general, know a lot about the age of their assets but it's a lot more challenging to truly understand what their performance is. And a key message that we've been taking to the sector over the last couple of years is that we would like to see councils get a better understanding of not only condition, but also performance in particular of their critical assets. So um, another point from the, our audit of the 18 LTPs, um, most councils we found just included a really generic discussion of natural hazards and climate change based on the Ministry for the Environment and other nationally available information. So they didn't have that more sort of nuanced, in general, didn't have that more nuanced um, demonstration of their understanding of what the impacts are more locally and what that means for their infrastructure resilience. So if, if councils um, don't have uh, the level of understanding of the risks that, that their infrastructure um, uh, faces from climate change, then that makes it really challenging them, for them to advise their elected members of these risks and to communicate those risks to the community um, and to then make informed decisions about how to manage their assets in response to that. So I guess the key message is um, better understanding of risk in order to be able to engage with your elected members who are ultimately the ones who are responsible for um, engaging with communities and um, signing off the LTPs. So turning now to um, getting ready for the 2021 LTPs, um, we've just sent, given to our auditors some guidance that we've prepared for them, setting out what they should expect to see in the LTPs and associated infrastructure strategies. So we've said that they should expect to see three key assumptions. Um, the first one, the expected effects of climate change on that council's district, city or region. Um, we recognise that count, some councils will not necessarily have prepared their own um, local um, assessment of climate impacts, um, but we would expect to see a, a, um, a movement towards that um, or some recognition of um, where the gaps are and, and how they might fill those. So expected effects of climate change and then um, the potential impacts from those effects on council activities and finally the impacts on the community more broadly and what that might then mean for um, how, how councils um, uh, manage their infrastructure. And just separately to that, so there's the assumptions, but there's also what we expect to see in terms of disclosures. So what information councils um, should be disclosing about their understanding of climate change effects and impacts. So in disclosures in the infrastructure strategy that we've indicated to auditors that they should expect to see um, are the key decisions a council expects to make about service levels, council finances, CAPEX and OPEX work programs for the period of the HTP. And secondly, how climate change might affect the most likely scenario for the management of the council's infrastructure assets during the 30-year um, period of the infrastructure strategy. And finally, what climate change means 
when providing infrastructure resilience and how the council intends to manage the identified risks. So um, our expectations really link back to our areas of interest. Climate change is here. The statutory obligations under the Local Government Act to provide for the resilience of infrastructure. And we're seeing um, increasingly um, a high public interest in, in growing public expectations of their councils, particularly those councils that have declared climate emergencies. The Society of Local Government Managers has just issued guidance um, for the sector that some of you may have seen on climate change in the LTP. And I just wanted to highlight some key points from that guidance that um, talks about setting the standard for the 2021 LTPs. So they, um, the standard is that you should be using an evidence-based scenario on the effects of climate change, which is consistently applied across your council, should be making progress with identifying the local impacts of climate change on the council's activities, and um, the council should have identified and considered how impacts on the community might flow through to the council. For example, could changes in economic activity patterns affect affordability? So um, just turning now to, again, to impacts, each activity manager at the council will need to identify the impacts of climate change on their own activities, um, especially infrastructure networks. And um, we've, we've indicated that these assumptions should be reviewed centrally to ensure comprehensiveness and consistency of, of approach across the council. So councils, councils activity managers should be looking at things like um, three waters impact, capacity issues, stock bank, stock bank breaches and overflowing, water security, water quality, whether there might be an increased rich risk of sewage overflows, um, your transport infrastructure, damage disruptions due to flooding, erosion, etc., impacts of more frequent severe weather events on planned modal shifts. Um, might you look at switching between walking and cycling and into public transport more as an option? Biodiversity and pest management. Uh, might there be changes in the type and distribution of pest species? Coastal infrastructure and property, inundation and rise in water tables, increased risk of erosion, increased salination, and of course, insurance risks. And some of your other infrastructure might be impacted as well. So just to summarize, what we think needs to happen for 2021, and this is really challenging, Councils should be transparent with their communities about their current understanding of risk and what this means for future decision making. And as I noted earlier, you need to acknowledge, councils need to acknowledge their information gaps and identify programs to address those. One important focus should be on better understanding the performance and condition of your most critical assets. And you need to think about your level of uncertainty and your assumptions, and therefore how robust your financial forecasting is. You need to be transparent about that. And you also need to consider about how you engage with your elected members and your community. How do you communicate risk? Do you have the trust and confidence of your community to have the hard conversations? And I recognise that the challenges for councils in achieving transparency um, are, are huge. And Brandy will be talking about Capity Coast District Council's challenges um, that, of course, include risk of litigation. I just wanted to highlight um, from Local Government New Zealand's press release yesterday um, in response to the National Climate Change Risk Assessment um, what, what they say in terms of um, in terms of that that risk around transparency, they noted that there's a massive central government legislative hole in the area of climate change adaptation, and noted the legal opinion issued last year by Jack Hodder that noted that councils are damned if they do and damned if they don't when either undertaking work to address climate change adaptation, as well as consenting development in at-risk areas due to the litigation risks. And litigating over a long period on a complex issue such as climate change is an extremely expensive way to sort out this issue. So just some questions for, um, 
for councils and others to ponder um, when thinking about the 2021 LTPs? What's your understanding of the expected effects of climate change and impacts? What effects and impacts are you planning on disclosing in your 2021 LTP? What initiatives does your council have to collect local data and identify local impacts from climate change? How are you going to have the discussions with your community? And what are the challenges more generally in talking about climate change and risk with your elected members? So just a, um, a couple of minutes now on um, our work program. So um, we have um, indicated in our annual plan um, a three-year program of work around climate change and resilience. So for this financial year, um, we're looking at what action councils are planning for climate change from both an adaptation and mitigation perspective. And we're particularly interested in those councils that declared climate emergencies. How are they giving effect to this declaration? Um, it's, it's, are we seeing action um, or is it, um, is it rhetoric without the action sitting behind it? And then from in 2021-22, um, we will be reviewing, analysing the 2021 LTPs or a sample of them to establish how well councils are factoring in resilience to climate change risk and vulnerabilities into their long-term planning. Again, the, the climate-related actions they plan to take and highlight any funding pressures or information gaps that they've identified in the LTPs. And then um, in 2022, um, we are at this stage planning on having a closer look at the Zero Carbon Act and what role we might take in assessing the public sector's performance and meeting the requirements set out in, in that Act. Um, Recognising, of course, that the Climate Commission has a role in reviewing <clears throat> the implementation of that Act. And we're particularly interested in um, the reporting power um, in the Act that enables the, the Minister or the Climate Commission to develop regulations requiring reporting organisations like councils to provide information about their governance of risk, um, what the actual and potential effects of the risks and equally opportunities are from climate change on councils' business, their strategy and their financial planning, the processes that they plan to identify, use to identify, assess and manage risk, and the metrics and targets used to assess and manage risks and opportunities. So we're also thinking of doing a, a bit of a comparison to the, um, the UK's own Climate Change Act of 2008 um, and what the review of that act has had to say in terms of its implementation. And finally, we're also, um, we're just about to kick off the work looking at quite a small discrete piece of work looking at local government risk management. And um, it's, it stems back to a report that was prepared post the Earth, Canterbury earthquakes in 2013 um, that looked at insurance and insurance challenges and um, council's approaches to managing risk. And one of the high level findings from that report was that many councils have weak risk management practices. Um, and linking back to our interest in governance, accountability and transparency, good risk management is really key um, to ensure that councils have the trust and confidence of their communities and equally of parliament. So um, what we're starting, starting by doing is having a look at a, um, a suite of climate change frameworks. So the ISO 31000 standard for risk management and a couple of others so that we can identify at a very high level what the key characteristics and principles are of good risk management in a local government context. And then we plan on doing some case studies of um, four or five councils looking at their risk management practices, focusing on those that we know already are doing a pretty good job to highlight what, what good looks like. Um, and 
and also uh, planning on preparing a, a very simple high level survey that we will be sending to councils asking them about how they think they are um, performing in the risk management space and what they might want to see in terms of support from, from ourselves and from others. Um, so that's that's really it from me. Um, I will now hand off to the next speaker. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, very interesting and uh, appropriate focus there on on the importance of risk management and risk governance. And I'm going to sort of drill into that a little bit more um, with a particular focus on, on climate. So this next session, everyone, um, Glenn, my colleague, is going to join me towards the end. Um, and we're going to focus uh, in more detail around climate change considerations within infrastructure strategies and infrastructure planning. Um, and the agenda I've got here is I'll start a quick start with a quick high level overview of the strategic approach to climate change, looking at infrastructure strategies and and I guess the requirements uh, that that requires of of asset managers, focusing then on both climate adaptation and then uh, quickly on mitigation and carbon, and Glenn's going to finish with some thoughts around what is good practice and uh, maturity within climate change adaptation and mitigation. We've also got our second poll that we've just put up there, so feel free to give your thoughts on that. Um, so beginning here with, uh, I guess, a high level overview of uh, the need for a strategic approach. So if we move from left to right on the screen, um, a council will have its overall vision and outcomes that it's seeking, and that, that needs to permeate through its infrastructure strategy, its spatial plan, its financial strategy, its and its approach to man managing emergencies through its civil defence and emergency response plans. That all then needs to, or can, filter through into a framework for managing risk and resilience, and sim similarly uh, also in managing carbon emissions. But in the context of resilience, which is I guess a big part of what we're discussing today, uh, our recommendation is that an organisation has a strong resilience framework and policy and definitions, that's number one. It goes through a process of understanding those gaps in their, understand, in, in their resilience practice, particularly around climate change, but that might also extend into natural hazards and there's various methods that can be used to identify gaps more broadly. Uh, filling those gaps through building knowledge and evidence and then finally implementing those resilience initiatives that are going to uh, respond to those key risks. And they might fall within an infrastructure context or building it or making infrastructure more robust. Uh, similarly, they might fall into land use planning, they might fall within civil defence uh, and emergency response planning, and they might also fall within broader community resilience initiatives. So it, there's a broad suite of responses. When we think about infrastructure strategies, I'll just remind people, and this comes from the Act, that the infrastructure strategy must outline how the local authority intends to manage its infrastructure assets, taking into account the need to provide for the resilience of infrastructure assets by identifying and managing risks relating to natural hazards and by making appropriate financial provision for those. And Kristen has just spoken to that in detail. So what do we mean by resilience? And there's a thousand, thousands of definitions, but this one is, is broad and captures a lot of what we're talking about. And, and it's useful to, to have these definitions to, to ground ourselves in, in our thinking. This is from the National Infrastructure Unit um, and reads that the concept of resilience is wider than natural disasters and covers the capacity of public, private and civic sectors to withstand disruption, absorb disturbance, act effectively in a crisis, adapt to changing conditions, including climate change, and grow over time. It's a mouthful, but there's a lot in there, and I think it's it's useful because it covers the broad suite of, of stresses and, and shocks that we might experience, but also the breadth of how we respond to those across councils. There is guidance out there, and I'm um, 
there are a range of New Zealand based, I guess, uh, guidance manuals or guidance documents that are, that are helpful in some aspects, including, for example, the coastal guidance. This particular one from IPWEA uh, is useful in terms of looking at climate change impacts on the useful life of infrastructure. So I wanted to just signal that to people as well. When we're coming to factoring in climate risk, there is, I guess, uh, more confusion and less clear guidance, and that points to Kristen's earlier comment around uh, their focus on, on what good looks like in, in, in assessing risk. So I'm going to talk through climate risk in this section in a bit more detail. The first point to make is that when we think about climate change risk, we need to think about the activities that we're dealing with within uh, our infrastructure. So on the right of that diagram, you've got energy, water, transport, wastewater, et cetera, solid waste. And then we also need to think about those climate hazards that affect those. So it's, it's taking that um, evidence-based view of what climate stresses and hazards are likely to cause impact on our infrastructure system. So that's pretty straightforward. Then we come to designing and implementing processes for assessing risk. We need to be quite careful because the context is key. And as you can see in these bullet points here, you can have a national district or regional level assessment. And you would have seen the national level climate risk assessment. Um, I had quite a bit of involvement with the built environment section of that. And that is a very high level assessment that points to uh, broad level impacts across three waters energy, landfills, uh, transportation, etc. The What councils and asset owners will need to do is, is look at those types of risks in relation to their local area so that the context becomes quite different. So again, you can have sectoral level risk assessments or even industry or corporate level risk assessments. And I've mentioned the TCFD here, I'm gonna talk about that um, uh, in a couple of slides. Second point is that any risk-based approach needs to recognise the influence of uncertainty and it needs to use agreed and simple definitions. And this is one of the problems, um, I guess, that is, is evident in, in risk-based assessments is that we've got different areas of practice that are sort of coming together. And as an example, we've got the, the asset management practice, we've got disaster risk management and emergency response, and we've got this this practice around climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, all of which use slightly different language when they're talking about, say, risk or mitigation or adaptation, and they use slightly different frameworks for assessing risk. My over, overarching comment and suggestion is that choose a, choose a an approach that uh, you are comfortable with, that your stakeholders and your elected members are, are comfortable with, gives them the messages that they uh, that they can interpret and make good decisions on. But it is important to understand that breadth of, of definitions and frameworks as well. The assessment must be transparent and repeatable. It needs to involve all stakeholders and partners and must be cognizant of the level of granularity which is appropriate. And this is one of the lessons from the National Risk Assessment and going to Kristen's point earlier. Uh, for an asset owner, you might have data that enables you to look at detailed increments of sea level rise and do some quite, ge quite detailed geospatial analysis of your infrastructure networks, uh, referencing the hazard, how critical it is, and what material or how, how vulnerable um, that infrastructure network might be in different parts. You might have data that, that allows you to do a really granular level of, of risk assessment. Conversely, for other climate hazards, such as extreme temperature or, or uh, changes in, in, in wind, for example, or, or fire weather, you probably can't do a geospatial assessment at their level of detail, but you still can capture those risks at a high level and evaluate them and develop response planning. So it's, it's that level of granularity which is key when you're coming to design these approaches. This diagram, uh, again, talks about different types of risk. And this comes from, uh, I mentioned earlier, the proposed mandatory disclosure requirements that the government is signaling. And this comes from something called the TCFD, which is the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, and they group climate risks into two types, physical and transitional, on the left there. And there are also opportunities from climate change, and, and those are worth considering as well. But on the risk side, the physical risks are self-evident, and they are the risks that come 
from both acute and chronic or uh, shock and stress events, but the transitional risks are slightly different and worth considering, and they are defined as those risks that an organization faces from transitioning to a zero carbon economy or zero carbon future. And they might be legal risks, they might be risks in terms of reputation, they might be risks in terms of carbon prices and uh, what that means to an organisation going forward. Um, it might be technology, the ability to get um, supply chains functioning as they always have because of carbon prices, et cetera. So there's a whole range of, a whole category of what's called transitional risks that have been defined and are, and are very useful to consider on top of the physical risks as well. When we're doing risk assessment approaches, there are various levels. Often it's a first pass risk screening that is that is uh, the first stage. Most organisations might go to a second more detailed risk assessment and we're seeing that um, in a lot of our work with councils that are starting to do climate specific climate change risk assessments. They're doing a first pass screening and then a more detailed second pass risk assessment. And in some cases, um, a third pass might be useful as well when you're really drilling into certain things that are priorities. This diagram comes from NCARF in Australia and from their Coast Adapt program. Also, I wanted to say, wanted to focus a little bit on, uh, for the asset managers listening, around these components of a risk assessment. And they will vary depending, as I mentioned, on the context, the data available, and the level of granularity or detail, and the design is key. So if we take those first three bubbles there, most people are familiar with the concept of likelihood and consequence. And that might be the likelihood of an asset failing, which is generally in an asset manager's world, driven from its condition and its material or its age. So that might define in some cases, a risk assessment looking at that likelihood of failure. And the consequence is generally driven by how important that asset is. So we've got a simple risk equation of likelihood and consequence uh, that relates to an asset or a level of service. If we then introduce a climate hazard and or, an, or a natural hazard for that matter into that equation, we've got potentially a three bubbles to our risk assessment. And that's that second tier down where your likelihood actually becomes the combined likelihood of failure related to that vulnerability of an asset in relation to that hazard, that climate hazard. So it might be increasing sea level rise or coastal inundation impacting on coastal infrastructure that might be poorly designed. So we've got a combination of factors that might influence that likelihood of failure in that bottom part. And the consequence remains the same. So what I'm suggesting here is that a risk assessment needs to be tailored to the context and the level of data and detail that you've got. Another really important point is, I'm just going to move my little thing there. So when we're doing a climate risk assessment, it's important to consider multiple time horizons. We've got risks that are, as we saw originally, those RCP scenarios are changing over time. We're constantly getting um, new information and say for RCP 8.5 or, or any of them for that matter, the, the predictions are increasing. So we need to consider risk currently. In present day, we might choose a time horizon at 2050 and we might choose another time horizon at 2100. And you get a, a spectrum of risk that allows your decision making to, to be tailored to those risks that, for example, might be coming higher extreme earlier than others. And in this case, this example, which is an Australian one, looks, for example, this uh, transport one, increased rainfall intensity and in, uh, flooding in, of low-lying roads is becoming high currently and extreme earlier than some of the others. So this might uh, cause it to be higher on your priority list. So having different time horizons when you're looking at climate risks is a useful way of prioritization. And this is what the National Risk Assessment has done, looking at various RCP scenarios uh, and various time horizons. I won't go into detail on this, but I wanted to flag that there are other methods and increasingly we're seeing pathways assessments being utilized or in some, some people call them dynamic adaptive policy pathways, another piece of jargon for you, DAPP. And this is something that is present within the coastal guidance and is useful to think about, particularly in coastal areas, and allows um, planners and asset managers to think about uh, decision making under uncertainty and what triggers or thresholds might cause you to move from a, a predetermined pathway to another. And in this example here, you've got 
um, education programs and flood management, raising the height of land, soft structural options, hard structural options, etc. So these become, I guess, uh, more uh, severe interventions that you move to as different climate thresholds are met over time. And those thresholds might be related to water levels or um, flood levels, etc. When we're coming to respond to the risks, we need to think about avoid, mitigate, transfer, except if we're going to use the standard risk management language, a climate uh, practitioner might say defend, accommodate or retreat. Um, but our infrastructure strategies must identify those likely scenarios and when key decisions uh, need to be made. And this gives you some ideas of where the different types of responses might sit. So avoid might be land use change or manage retreat. Mitigating might be an infrastructure solution or your emergency response planning. Insurance is a key factor in your tr risk transfer. Um, and accepting the risk as well, or accepting potentially lower levels of service over time. Very briefly, and I'm sort of conscious of time here, uh, in terms of carbon emissions and climate change mitigation. 75% of infrastructure that will exist in 2050 hasn't been built yet. This is an estimate from an organisation called Basel. And if we are going to continue building infrastructure that is high carbon, then uh, that is not going to get us towards our uh, 1.5 degree target. So this is a, a major opportunity and a risk, if you like, that we continue building, I guess, infrastructure of yesterday for tomorrow's challenges. And councils and asset managers' roles are both within their own organisational carbon, both in terms of operations and the capital carbon, um, and in the community emissions as well. Down the bottom here is a standard approach to understanding emissions at a community level, so doing baseline inventory, setting targets, deciding on your strategies and funding those going forward around reducing emissions. And a number of councils are progressing this. I've got a couple, um, this is, these aren't the only two, but I've got Auckland's and Queenstown's um, climate change plans there. And I know Wellington's done a lot of work, as have Carpety and, and many others. When we're thinking about um, when we're thinking about carbon, we need to think about where the best op opportunity for reducing carbon is, and that is often in the early stages of planning. And there's less opportunity to reduce carbon in once you hit the construction and operational phases. And an important consideration is which part of the carbon life cycle are we interested in? And this diagram here, which is really useful, I think comes from the World Green Building Council, is that we've got embodied carbon, upfront carbon, end of life carbon, and, and basically the carbon cycle through all our infrastructure um, uh, life cycle is important to understand. And these are things that will, I think emerge over the next few years is what is good practice in, in, in becoming fluent, if you like, around the carbon problem. I'm going to hand over quickly to Glenn, uh, who's going to talk us through this idea of asset management maturity. Thanks, Glenn. You're on mute. Can't hear. Just check the top of the screen there, Glenn, on the camera button and the mic button. Nope. Michelle, are you getting anything? No, I'm not sure, Glenn, what's going on, but um, if James can go through your slides or we can move forward to Brandy and we can rejoin. Yeah. Glenn, I might just flick through them for you if that's uh, it's okay. <laughs> Still got nothing. You can do sign language. How about that? And I can, like, you, you can... Um... <laughs> right. Okay, people, I'm going to just go through this because... Um, Glenn and I went through this earlier, so I'll try and do it justice. 
So there's some drivers for maturity um, around the complexity of uh, an infrastructure system, the scale and criticality of it, and the rate of change that we're seeing uh, in this area. And there's a number of good examples around maturity that many of you will be aware of. Uh, LGNZ guidance, which came out, has some uh, a really useful back, back page on uh, good practice in terms of uh, climate uh, risk assessments and maturity. IIMM, which is the infrastructure, International Infrastructure Management Manual, is a really useful resource. And one that we particularly like is this uh, FCM manual, which has uh, maturity information, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation. When we're looking at um, maturity for adaptation and mitigation, there are various areas which you'll be well aware of, including policy, human resources, how we um, manage our networks and cooperate with others, and particularly leadership and governance, which Kristen had alluded to again earlier. And then when we move into the both the adaptation and mitigation side, there are specific areas of practice that are useful to consider um, that are different. And as an example, and I've just we've taken this one from the LGNZ uh, document, uh, and this is around risk assessment and adaptation planning. So if you're starting out, there's generally uh, no or limited understanding of infrastructure exposed to climate change or limited understanding of risk to communities or to councils, finances or reputation, et cetera. Moving forward and improving practice, the risk and vulnerability assessment framework can be developed and commenced. And as, as maturity improves, those assessments are undertaken, high risk prioritised and options and or pathways referring to that language from earlier, can be developed. And leading practice might be that adaptation options are developed and implemented, risks are regularly reviewed and updated, and communities and elected members for that matter are aware and engaged in decision making within a robust and transparent process. So that's um, helpful there. I'm just gonna flick forward. And the, the gap in maturity is a useful way to think about it. And I think Glenn's point here was that the, there's potentially a larger gap in terms of the rate of change and complexity in the mitigation space. Uh, and notwithstanding that sea level rise and climate change more generally are important areas, but the mitigation space is something that in um, Kristen mentioned that's in the sort of 2021-22 area, how, how organisations and asset managers respond to the low carbon challenge is going to be key. Um, I'm going to flick now just to a closing slide and then we're going to hand over to Brandy. And trying to wrap this up, so first point in closing is that we need to, and asset managers and planners need to understand the relevant climate drivers and natural hazards, what may be exposed and what risks this may present to the infrastructure networks. Roles and responsibilities are key and defining those uh, both within your organisation but within the organisations uh, that you partner with uh, is also very important. Reviewing adaptation and resilience measures that you are already working on. So there's a lot of good stuff that's already going on within um, most organisations and so that can all be brought together um, within a strategic approach to this. Integrating risk assessments with asset management planning and civil defence, that's really important. And those two, those three areas really go together well um, and are important in developing strong climate change resilience measures. And my final point is, uh, for those of you like languages, uh, I think carbon is the new language to learn. So if everyone can become fluent in what carbon means to their organisations, uh, I think that'll set us up well for success going forward. Thanks very much. I'm going to pass over to Brandy now. Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me today. As they said, my name is Brandy Griffin and I'm a climate change advisor at Kapiti Coast District Council. I have been at council for quite a few years now, but this is the only less than two months that I've been in this new role. And I did want to start by saying uh, this has been a really fascinating webinar to date and I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to participate. And I'd also go back to one of the things that Miles said at the very beginning of this. I would in no way call myself an expert in this topic. Um, we're all in this together. I've jumped in, I mean, I've dabbled in this space for several years, but I've jumped in uh, kind of boots first, 
uh, feet first, boots and all, and it's very much a learning process. So that's one of the reasons why uh, I believe I've been invited to speak today. I'm here to talk about our council's experience as we are actively working to implement climate change into our long-term planning. I would say that we are very much a mid-range council. Not only are we mid-range in terms of size and budgets, but in terms of how far we've progressed in this space. There are certainly some other councils that have progressed in areas, uh, you know, they are way beyond us. They are leading. And there are also others that I speak to where they are um, not quite as far as long. So in that regard, I think that we're a good case study to talk about what councils are trying to do with this information. With that caveat, one of the first things that I wanted to talk about is uh, council resolutions. In May of 2019, our council, Capitol Coast District Council, made two resolutions. The first one was to achieve carbon neutrality by 2025, and the second one was to declare a climate emergency. And in the minutes from that meeting, the, the minutes very specifically say that climate crisis issues in general are to be considered as part of all future decision-making reports and recommendations to council. And I wanted to start with this specifically because I wanted to say this is really beneficial to us as council officers. I know there's been some debate about the value of climate change emergency declarations, but for us, it's absolutely critical. It's been really helpful in that it gives us a very clear steer on what our council is expecting and what we've promised to the community. I have other colleagues that I've spoke to in some councils where their council may not be as supportive, and it makes it a lot more challenging for those officers to carry out all of the guidance that we're receiving from the Office of the Auditor General, SOLGAM, MFE, et cetera. Of course, it doesn't mean that a council has to declare a climate emergency to be supportive, but for us, it has certainly helped make it public. And the reason why I say that is because, just to reiterate, it is such a complex environment, this work program. A few of the things that both James and uh, Kristen said have been incredibly, you know, they really have rung true to me that there are a lot of different areas of expertise coming together here and each council has its own set of challenges and opportunities. I'm not gonna speak to every one of the boxes that I have on this slide, but I did just wanna say a few things particularly about political and legal risks, the science and what this means for uh, land information. As some of you might know, Capitol Coast District Council and made international news in 2012. We were one of the first councils to try and uh, effectively implement the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and start to incorporate that information and that science into our proposed natural, excuse me, our proposed district plan. And we found that we received, um, you know, I wouldn't say strong backlash, but backlash from key members of our community, groups organized in response. We went through the court system. So when Kristen referred to the legal risks involved, that started in 2012 and we continued to be in the court system through 2018 in regards to that. So as a result, it has absolutely created a little bit of risk aversion within our council and political risks as well. It's created an environment where our counselors don't want to be leading the pack in some of these areas. They are concerned about the decision making and what it could mean for their, um, you know, their standing with their constituents. And it's also caused us to be very cautious about our science and the information that we collect. While we know, and I still believe to this day, it was upheld when uh, our science was challenged as part of that process. The science was best practice. It involved NIWA and other uh, climate and coastal scientists throughout New Zealand and the world. We had an international peer review that upheld the science, but it was still a lengthy process. And it's made us a bit nervous about investing too much in science that um, could be challenged. It's incredibly expensive. So we've been very careful about how we go about gathering our science. And when I speak more, I'm going to come to that. The same with uh, the impact of what that information that we collect means for our limbs and things like that. Um, last thing I do wanna say as well is CMARS. 
Now, I know that James has talked about the importance of both mitigation and adaptation. One thing that is really wonderful about Capity is we have been CMARS certified since 2012. As I'm sure most of you know, CMARS is the Certified Emissions Measurement and Reduction Scheme. We've been um, certified for a long time now, and we've made a lot of progress in lowering our emissions. My colleague who works in this space at Council, he has this wonderful slide that he shows of a child below an apple tree picking apples. And one of the points that he makes for us is, even though we've been doing CMARS for a long time, we can't stop. We have picked the low hanging fruit, and now we're to the point where we're having to make some tougher decisions to ensure that um, we continue with CMARS and that we continue with our emissions reduction and that we make those uh, proper choices. So with that being said, I'm not gonna speak so much to mitigation. There's a lot that we could talk about there and I'm happy at any point in time to have discussions with people or to defer you to some of my colleagues who've worked in that area for a while. But I wanted to say, I'm gonna speak primarily about adaptation and identifying risks and risk management. So thinking about the guidance that we're receiving from Solgum and the Office of the Auditor General, we've been doing the mitigation part in terms of council emissions reductions for a long time. We also, though, are trying to understand where are we now as a council in terms of how well we are using uh, climate change assumptions and projections to think about uh, the risks that, that that can pose to our assets, to our activities, to our communities. And then we're wanting to incorporate that into our long-term term plan. So there's a few operating principles that are key to us, and some of these very much align with some of the operating principles that James presented earlier on. Of course, we want it to be best practice and collaborative. We want to be consistent not only with our colleagues, but also with um, across our council. And we want to be more transparent. So first, best practice and collaborate. Collaborative, excuse me. What's interesting about this is, as I already alluded to, we've had this concern in our council that we can use the NEWA national data, but it's important to have more detailed data for your, for your region. But we also know that, um, where we have learned through experience that we can be challenged on that, even when we are going to some of the best top scientists in the country. So we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we gather data that we feel can be as robust as possible and that will be um, defendable. And for that, we've turned to our regional partners and we've really relied on Greater Wellington and our, and our other uh, Wellington Regional Councils to make sure that in a sense, we're all on the same page. And we feel that this is important because it gives our councillors and our elected members a sense of security in that regard. Let me give you an example of what they've been doing. Greater Wellington has been really wonderful and this has taken a couple of years they have taken a wide range of climate indicators. I believe there's 14 variables specifically, and they've done a great job of not only creating regional maps that we can use, but also very specific projections or a range of assumptions for each area in our region. And by that, I mean each, each, each council district. This has been really good for us because as I've said before, we feel that it's defendable to be able to say we're all on the same page, we're doing this together. This is all based, of course, on the best science from NEWA, IPCC um, projections and international models, et cetera. But what we really like about this, as I've said before, we have concerns about collecting data and what does it mean for the information we hold uh, about properties and whatnot in our area. All of this information is already publicly available. And that for us has been a really useful way for us to increase our trans transparency. What we've been doing with that data for this LTP is literally going through all of our activities. And, I, and this is by no means what I have here complete, but just to give you a sample, to see what our activities have been doing, what information have they been using, where are they at, and where do we need to go in the future? So starting with some of our key infrastructures, transport, the waters, waste, 
we're actually happy to find that for a very long time, we have already had in their planning where they've been incorporating various climate change assumptions. Often this has been done because they are relying on uh, contractors and engineers like many of you to help develop our um, asset assessments, risk criticality assessments to work this into our planning. So what we're realizing is that we do actually have a lot of information, but it hasn't necessarily been as transparent as it probably needs to be. So if you look at the top line, I can show you, we feel really confident that our transport um, activity, they've been doing asset assessments, they've looked at a wide range of natural hazards, they've used the information on the 14 variables from Greater Wellington to start to think about if there are any um, hazards or climate change effects that they haven't given thought to. We've been looking at their work to make sure that it's been consistent across their planning. And, you know, we're really pleased. We can see the same with water, wastewater, the others. But what, what we're currently doing with those groups is also looking to compare, are there any variables or any effects that we've overlooked that we might need to think about? And identifying data gaps, which I'm going to come back to in a brief minute. Now we know that for some of these assets that by far they have big budgets and they're you know, very, very critical assets, we have more money to employ contractors and expert consultants to help us. As we've started to take, what we're starting to do now is take this information that we've gathered from those activities and we're helping to apply those same principles across some of our other activities. When I put this up, this for you see, for example, we have parks and open spaces, facilities and properties. By no means would I say that those teams have not considered any natural hazards, they have. So for example, through the earthquake legislation, we know that we've looked at earthquake prone buildings and others, but we're working with those teams. We're using some of the tools that we've gathered from the other activities to help make sure that they've been more consistent and that they've considered a wider range of variables across their planning process. One of the things that this has led us to is the data gaps. One of the things that we've realized that we certainly need, and this is something that we can't do right of way, is for Capity groundwater and water table rising is a really significant impact that we're trying to think about. And we're now working with Greater Wellington and having discussions with other researchers about what is the state of science in that area and what do we need to do to fill that gap? We're certain that we're not gonna be able to fill that gap between now and this 2021 LTP. But what we're hoping that we can do is we can get into our LTP some information on how, um, on how we're gonna fill that next. I've run out of time, but the last thing that I was gonna say is transparency. We see that we've been doing this for a really long time but it's absolutely uh, hidden in some ways. And we were, are working through our long-term plan and many of our policy work programs to try and bring this stuff forward so that we can be sure that the community and the counselors are more aware of what we're doing and participate in the process. With that, I think I've gone over my time. I would talk more about next steps, but I'll skip that and hand you guys back to uh, James and Kristen and the others for questions. Thanks, Brandy. That was that was really interesting, really helpful. Um, Miles, are you are you still there? We've got some time left, um, about six minutes, and we've also got some results of our polls as well. So, Glenn, did you is your mic working? Did you have? Is it working? It's working. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, introducing Glenn. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, I was just going to maybe throw up into the panel um, uh, some of the key questions that turned up in the chat as we went through the presentations. Um, so maybe if I if I go th just through um, each of them quickly, and it'll give people time to d digest a response, and then we'll just grab them. Um, uh, as you see fit. Um, so first question, uh, what work is going on at a broader level nationally to define roles and responsibilities of various organizations, e.g. regional 
um, TAs, central government, landowners, etc. Second question, um, what provisions are made for high quality professional training of the many different disciplines and sectors, public, private NGOs involved in carbon reduction across all our activities? And uh, third question, do we have a handle on how consistently local government is addressing the climate change issues? As an asset organisation with national coverage, it is important that we approach these things consistently. Is there any work in this area? Read the MFE guidance and is it an audit responsibility? So I'll throw that open to the panel. I might um, have a crack at that first one, which was around the broader Pretty, I think it's a pretty simple one from my point of view. What work's going on broad, at a national level to define roles and responsibilities? In my view, um, that's a gap. And uh, we've just seen the national risk assessment um, that's been released. We've There's a number of councils, regional councils primarily doing uh, their own regional climate change risk assessments that are in part trying to be consistent with the national methodology. Uh, so I think everyone's interpreting their own responsibilities slightly differently. Um, on the mitigation side, that is definitely a, an open question at the moment around what is council's role, um, both for their own operations, but also their role, more importantly, for, uh, for reducing community emissions. And, and to that point, their ability to even influence that in some areas. So I know that um, Kristen and Brandy will have thoughts on, on that one as well. Um, I, I have um, very little to say in, <laughs> in this space other than um, I think in one of the questions they they said, is it, is it asked whether it was an audit role? Um, we have quite a, a narrow role, um, the role of audit, um, which in some way we can't comment on policy um, it very much is reliant on what we see from the audit work and um, reflecting you know back back on the um, the, the uh, opinion that auditors are required to express on the LTP and underlying information so it does go back to the does it meet the does it, does it enable the council to give effect to the purpose of the act to be able to um, encourage participation from the community um, so is the consultation document for instance written in a way that presents the issues and risks and the principal options for addressing those in a way where the community can actually understand and engage in the process um, and and uh and the auditor you know will again like look at the um, underlying information and not question whether or not the council has actually made the right policy calls, but are they actually linking back the proposals that they're putting forward and the decisions that they plan to take on information that's based on a credible source? So it really does go back to that uh, a credible source of information um, and that that's being used consistently across the council and in a way to inform um, financial forecasting, recognising that nothing's perfect and there is elements of uncertainty. Mm. Can I add to that as well? Um, for both questions, the what work is going on at the broad national level, but also do we have a handle on how consistently local government is addressing these issues? Uh, one thing that I forgot to say in my presentation is there are a number of community of practices that have been developed across local government and they are proving to me to be invaluable. So there is a council climate network that we have uh, regular webinars and uh, they're organized by council officers who are just sharing information. Following those webinars, we are emailing tools and resources to each other so that we're not all reinventing the wheel. We also know through that we'll have guest speakers. So for example, we're having a webinar tomorrow and we have the Climate Change Commission chief executive speaking to us on what's happening there. And we also know there are some working groups that have representatives from local government working with central government, uh, DIA, MFE, 
and the Climate Change Commission to try and ensure that there is some consistency and that we have the tools that we need. By no means would I say those tools are fully developed, but there's a lot of great work in process. And um, I'd be happy afterwards to share information on some of the tools that I'm using, but also would love to hear from some of the rest of you. I'm sure that within each of the areas of expertise, there are a wide range of um, different communities of practice, and they are proving to be invaluable as we all figure this out together. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Thanks, Brandy. Um, look, we've come to the end of our session. Uh, from my point of view, I'd just like to thank everybody, uh, particularly Kristen and Brandy and Glenn and Miles for your inputs and also Michelle who helped organise everything. Thanks to everyone who attended. We're going to send the slides out. Um, so that'll be in a, in a day or so. And I think hopefully you'll have people's email addresses, Brandy and Kristen and, and ourselves. So if you've got any questions, please get in touch. We do have the results of the polls. Um, and the first poll around how well do you think your organization understands and manages climate risk? The results were largely in the middle. 50% were in the somewhat, and 23% uh, thought very well. Very few thought extremely well. Uh, the second poll was uh, what do you think the biggest barrier was to managing climate risk? Uh, those were governance and funding. And the last poll, I haven't got it here, but from memory, it was around how urgently do you think we are acting? And most people I saw where their results were in the, we need to act soon, yesterday. So um, useful information and uh, uh, sort of uh, taking the pulse of people's people's views. So I think we'll leave it at that. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, Nami hinui, kia koutou katoa. Thank you. <laughs>